Colossians, the first chapter, verse 9. The message today is entitled, How to Walk with God All Pleasing. How to Walk with God All Pleasing. All right, this is from the words of the Apostle Paul, who helped. He was one of the holy men of God who wrote the scriptures, as the Bible tells us. Holy men of God wrote this Bible as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In Colossians 1 and 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. God wants us to walk all pleasing with Him. And you've got to be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding to do this. Then he continues, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And that's something that you might work worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now that's a great command of the Holy Ghost for your life and mine. I want to read a very serious uh, scripture in conjunction with this as part of the text to begin with found in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews the 13th chapter. That's the last chapter. Verses 20 and 21. Alright, the scripture says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now you know what it says here? Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, God will make us perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you or me, that is, that which is well-pleasing, well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, if we are let Him. Now, you know the reason Christians live in sin, and a lot of them always have backslid and in and out and up and down, and never really have the victories, because they don't try. If you try, you can live a sanctified, holy lifestyle, and you, through the blood of Jesus, can will be perfect in every good work to do God's will and Him working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight. And that's Jesus Christ who will work this new life in us that Christians and preachers today don't want, don't understand, and the preachers don't preach it. No wonder people don't live it. How are you going to live something when you don't hear it? The Bible said faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. People have to hear it preached that you can live a sanctified life or they're not going to live it. A lot of them won't live it then. But they're not going to live it unless you do. And preachers just will not preach it. You know why? Because preachers mostly are ecclesiastical hobos themselves. They like to sin. Like one pastor, somebody told me about some time ago, said he sees a woman in a pair of tight pants and said, oh, I just feel like going up and patting them on the sit-down place. Now, ain't that cute? No wonder the church is in such a mess, taking a bunch of preachers like that. Like God can't give you a victory or won't go pat a woman on her sit-down place because she's got tight pants and revealing. Why didn't he say a few more things he'd like to do? Gals in these tight pants, say, if a man's not sanctified, it makes him want to do a lot of things he ought not to talk about. God sakes in this world. The Bible says you can walk all pleasing and walk holy and live without sinning in your heart or having eyes that are filled with lust and adultery. I know the Bible says in 2 Peter, the second chapter, verse 14, that many have eyes full of adultery and they cannot cease from sin. I know that. That don't mean a sanctified man or woman. That means some old hoopalele just hangs around a church or claims to be a preacher, gets out here, their old eyes full of adultery. They could quit sinning if they wanted to because they don't believe you can live a sanctified, holy lifestyle through the blood of the everlasting covenant and Jesus can work in us all things that are well-pleasing in His sight. 
He ain't pleased with no such mess as that. Jesus sakes in this world. Christ and God must be honored in every word and in every act and every thought that we think. Did you know that? To live a life all pleasing to God and to Christ our blessed Lord. You can live such a life if you want to. The reason people don't live it, don't want to. They got eyes full of, adul of adultery. Look at some old gal or another man. Get all stirred up just for looking. Jesus said you don't have to commit adultery with the very acts and you can look and lust and you're still guilty of the sin of adultery. The Bible's got a lot to say about those things and where you're going if that's the way you live. It tells you what's going to, what your end will be. We need to believe the Bible. We need to believe the Bible. In the same author's writing, in Colossians, the third chapter, listen to this. Same author, the old brother apostle Paul, the great writer of most of the New Testament. All right, <clears throat> listen to this. Verse 9. Oh, no, I want to start back a little further than that. Verse 8. But now you also put off these, if you're a Christian, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. You don't talk nasty. You don't use them little nice four-letter words that these vulgar Americans and even a lot of Christians use. You quit using them. If you're really saved. Most Christians aren't really saved. That's what's wrong with them. Lie not one to another, seeing you put off the old man with his deeds. Quit your stake in life. And have put on the new man. That's Christ, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. See, he's created. That new man in us is created in the image of Christ Jesus. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew. See, there's no respect of person of God if you're Greek or a Jew, if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. If you're barbarian or Scythian, you're bond or free, you're slave or you're free, you're in jail or you're free. Christ is all and in all. And he says, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, you put these on. Bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is a bond of perfectness. The bond of perfectness. That's doing everything well-pleasing in God's sight. Somebody says you can't be perfect. No, you're not going to be perfect to your mom and daddy, your wife and husband, and your employer and employees and the neighbors and all like that. But you can be perfect with God. You can do things all well-pleasing in God's sight. That's what the Bible's all about. That's what Christ came to this world for. Shed his blood for. Died to sanctify us. That we could live all pleasing to God. All right, let's go a little further. In 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, verse 1. From the great apostle Paul. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God. He's telling us how to walk and please God. He said, you ought to abound more and more. Abound means to overflow a team. Just be effusive. Running over with good works, good thoughts, good deeds, good acts that manifest the nature of Christ that he gave us through the blood of Jesus when he saved us and redeemed us and made us a new creature that we show forth the manifest new life that that new person in us identifies with. And he doesn't identify with corruption and sin and immorality. He says, you ought to know how we've taught you to walk and please God and abound. Let's get better and better. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus? For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. You're not going to please God unless you're sanctified. That ye should abstain from fornication or immorality. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. That's your body. That's where the temple of the 
That's where Christ and the Holy Ghost lives is in this vessel. He don't live in a house. He don't live in a, a stuccoed mansion. He don't live in a temple or a church house. He lives in these vessels, these bodies that are holy. It says, you need to know how to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. Honor God. Honor Christ. Be Christ honoring. God honoring. In everything you do, honor Christ. Or you're not going to please God or you're not going to go where you think you're going. Unless you've got another thought. Most, most Americans think they're going to heaven. Well, they're not. He said that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence. Not in lewdness. Even as the Gentiles, which don't know God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we forewarn you and testify. For God has not called us unto uncleanness. He called us out of the world, out of sin, out of the slave market of the devil, to holiness. He didn't call you to get into church or to claim to be a Christian and start living like a vagabond. That's not the life of Christ, and that is not acceptable with God. And he said, He therefore that despiseth, that's holiness, despiseth not man but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. It's amazing how preachers don't preach this, and people that don't know the Bible, you start quoting the Bible and preaching and teaching the Bible, and they look at you like you got the Koran or the Buddhist Bible, the Zenda Vista, or you got the Book of Mormon or some other old corrupt thing, one of these perverted Bibles and preaching out of it. When you're preaching, the uncorruptible, uncompromising Word of the Lord. Why don't Americans appreciate the Word of God? Because they got so much sin and the lust and the adultery in their hearts, they don't want to hear it. It condemns them. It's their faint hearts. It's not their brilliant intellect that rejects it. It's their old faint heart. And faint heartedness and fearfulness and double mindedness is ruining most Christians. They're fearful. They're faint-hearted. They're double-minded. They want to serve God on Sunday and leave God alone the rest of the week. Not even sometimes, not all Sunday, just Sunday morning a little while. That's not serving God. It's not pleasing God. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 6, Without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe it that he is, and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. The verse before it says, By faith Enoch walked with God, and was not found because God translated him. But before his translation, he had testimony, this testimony. Listen, before Enoch was translated or raptured out of this world, he had a testimony that he pleased God, not man. Before he got out of this world, the church is there. Oh, the rapture, the rapture. We're going off any time now. It's not that way, but still, it's a free country. You can get out here and holler and squall what you want to squall. It's too free. You get out and stamp the American flag and desecrate it in public and all that kind of mess and burn it. It's too free. It's too much freedom. Too much freedom. God's going to break it. Don't worry about that. You just got to wait a little while. So let's just... Be long-suffering and patient with God. But I tell you one thing, you might desecrate the flag and get by the Supreme Court, but I know the Supreme Court, if you sin, you're not going to get by. If you don't please God, there's a court coming up. There's a tribunal that's already set. It's already predetermined. It's already written. Turn away and read it. The 20th chapter of Revelation, verse 11. Mm-mm. And I saw a great white throne, and he that sat upon it, from whose face the heavens and the earth fled away, there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the book was open. That's the book of life. And the books were open. That's the Bible. And the dead were judged out of the books right here, according to to their works. Each individual judged according to his own sins or righteousness. I tell you folks, there's a bad time coming in this world that tribunal is set. There will be no Chief Justice Rehnquist or Associate Justice 
Marshall or White or Connor or anybody else to appeal to. There's no appellate court when you, when you appear before God's throne to answer for the stupidity of a life sin to reign in your mortal body in this lifetime. You're going to answer him and him alone. And Jesus, your attorney or advocate, now will be there to help you. He won't be on your case anymore. He's done resigned your case because it's hopeless. Now, when Jesus quits your case, that's a bad situation. Before God's tribunal, he won't be there to plead for you like he's up there by God now making intercession for a sinner and even a sinning Christian. Now, this great apostle, I want you to turn back here to Philip on Ephesians, the fifth chapter. I want you to listen to this. You think a sinning Christian's got a chance of a snowball in hell? You're foolish. Ephesians 5 and 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Fit on these old Calvinist preachers tell you can sin every day. It's a lie to hell. Paul the Apostle didn't echo no such a response as you hear in the pulpits today. These old preachers taking up for these stinking alley cats out here calling themselves Christians. He said fornication, that's immorality and uncleanness. That's homosexuality or lesbianism or covetousness. That's stinginess, greediness. In the seven deadly sins of the Catholic Church, they call it avarice. said, don't let it be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, clowning, which are not convenient, but rather giving a thanks. For this you know, that no whoremonger, listen to this, you know this, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor a covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God, it don't make no difference. You claim to be a Christian, belong to the church, have been baptized, or whatever. It means anybody. He said anybody. Let no man deceive you, says in the next verse. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. The people that commit these things, God says, the wrath of God will be on them. Be ye not therefore partakers with them. Don't you go with them and commit the same acts they perform. For ye were sometimes darkness. That's what God called us. We were in darkness. But now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness. People claim they got the fruit of the Spirit budding and blooming and producing fruit in their lives. Listen, if they've got the fruit of the Spirit, it's in goodness and righteousness and truth. The fruit of the Spirit is not corrupt. The fruit of the Spirit don't have wormholes and blights and blemishes and immaturity even in it. Praise God. Proving what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. They sneak around and do things God said it's a shame to even talk about it on the lips of a saint. <clears throat> Were you called to be a saint or just called to be an old vagabond church member of Christian? <laughs> Philippians 4, continue with Brother Paul, our great Bible teacher. Philippians 4. Let's take a look here a little further into the depth and the height and the breadth and the width of this great message. Verse 13. <clears throat> he said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And you can too. Right. Notwithstanding, <clears throat> ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. There were people here in this Philippian church who was unlike the other churches in the fact that they had a concern for this great apostle, their father in Christ. And they would take up offerings and send them by the hands of two or three messengers from their church to wherever Paul happened to be 
residing temporarily as a missionary and an apostle and evangelist in his time. And he said, you did communicate with my affliction. Communicate in old King James English means that you shared with my affliction. You shared your substance, your money. Now, in, now you Philippians know also, I love this, that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated or shared with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. That's a wonderful church. That's a wonderful eulogy, isn't it, to be pinned on the uh, headstone of a lot of dead saints? They're dead. But Paul's got the, the epitaph here to put on the headstone of that Philippian church. <laughs> a giving church. And a good giving church is a good living church. I mean, if you really give to God right. I know you can go to a lot of big churches and they got large sums of money they cough up. They didn't nobody give much of nothing. Usually they don't even give their tithe. You know what the average Christian in America gives to the Lord's work? Oh, oh, oh. I mean the Christian, the professing Christian as an average in America, you know how much he gives to God's work? Two percent. Big deal! Hooray for America. These boneheaded Christians in this country. That's a big deal, isn't it? Two percent. I guarantee you a lot of if you sift it down further, you find out that the most of that two percent is the average of those that give something worthwhile to God. The man on the bottom don't give nothing. Now he said, even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again into my necessity. Now listen to this. This Paul was not greedy like these American preachers are today, covetous, racketeering, performing all kinds of phony ceremonies and uh, theological <laughs> hoop nannies and medicine shows just to get people's money. He wasn't that kind of a preacher. <clears throat> but he said in Thessalonica, you sent once and again to my necessity, not because I desired a gift from you. I wasn't looking for money from you. But I desired fruit that may abound to your account. I wanted you to give so God could bless you for it. You're not going to get blessed with God. Somebody says, well, look at, the, look at what, what's happening to me. I don't do it. Well, that's what happened to Donald Trump. And he don't do it. That's what happened to Wal Wal uh, Sam Walton. He don't do it. Look what happened to a lot of other billionaires and millionaires in America. They don't do it. Them's the kind of people the Bible reveals. You ought to go over that 17th chapter of Psalm. Read about how God pours in these rich men's bosom the wealth of this world. And then he uses them to open their hearts and some of it trickles down to where you and I get our hands on a little bit of it. But you don't see Christians going around being wealthy people. All I know is I'm pretends to be. Pretenders are a dime a dozen in this country. You don't have to serve God in this country to get a little bit of money, a whole lot of money. But if you're serving God, if you're going to be a true Christian, you're going to have to please Him for God to bless you. You might look at your neighbor that's a gambler or a fornicator or a manipulator of the stock market, or a crook that runs a business and works the fingers raw on his employees for three thirty-five an hour. I hate that stupid minimum wage. You ought not to pay a dirty dog less than five dollars an hour if you're going to use it. Shh. Stinking rascals getting rich on the blood and sweat and toil and tears of these little dumb high school. Kids and graduates that can't get another job, get in there and working for almost nothing. God's going to judge them according to the fifth chapter of James. He said, whoa, go to now you rich, rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your garments are corrupted. Your riches are mothy. And God says the canker of your gold and silver is going to be a witness against you in the day of your judgment. Because you've used them poor labors to reap down your feet.
fields and you haven't paid them the wages that they deserved. God's going to get even with all this mess. He's going to straighten up. He's going to make crooked things straight and balance the ledger. God help us. I don't want to be in that judgment. Friends, if we're a real child of God, we know how to go to that point through judgment. There's another judgment for Christians. It's revealed in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Or 5 in verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That we may receive the things done in our body according to that which we have done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. It's not going to be an easy thing just to go to that judgment seat of Christ as a Christian. John gave us a revelation of facing Christ even in his judgment seat. That judgment seat of God in Revelation 20 verses 11 through 15. Now that's something else. That's the world being judged. That's when everybody's going to run and try to get behind a rock hide themselves from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. This other time some Christians come up to get our reward. In Revelation 1, John gave us a great preview of that time when we'll stand before Christ with his eyes as flames of fire. His mouth is open and out of it there came a piercing two-aged sword. His countenance is bright as the sun in his strength. In his hand were seven stars. His feet was if they were brass burning in a fiery furnace. And he said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he come and laid his hand upon me and said, Fear not, I am he that was dead. And behold, I'm alive again forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of hell. Praise God. Even at the best, even at the very best effort we make in pleasing God, when we see Christ on that judgment seat throne and waiting, we're in line to be judged and get a reward for the things we've done, good or bad, as a Christian. We're going to fall before him on our faces like we fainted or been shot between the eyes. Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Oh, dear God, help us to prepare for that great day that's yet coming our way. Lord, hear mercy says. Hebrews 13 and verse 6. 16, I beg your pardon. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. Speaking of communicating or sharing, laying up a treasure in heaven, that's pleasing to God. Now listen to this. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Hey, don't you want God to be pleased with your life? You remember Matthew 3 when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist? John saw him come and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And Jesus came up and asked to be baptized. And John forbade him, saying, I need to be baptized of thee. And Jesus said, No, you baptize me. For thus it suffered us to become, to fulfill all righteousness. And as he came up out of the water, a voice from heaven saying, A dove lit on his head, and a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Did you know that's what we've got to work for and earn in this life by our faithfulness and obedience to Jesus Christ and to God? Jesus revealed when we come to that throne for judgment in Matthew 25, he said he begins to take the records of every one of his servants. To one servant he gave five talents, he gained five more. To one he gave two, he gained two more. To one he gave one, and he went and hid it. But those that were faithful heard these words of commendation. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Be thou ruler over many things. Enter into the jaws of thy Lord. My God, what a wonderful, what a wonderful eulogy, commendation to receive from our blessed Lord because we've been faithful to him here 
in a few things in this brief lifespan of our best of three score and ten. And even the scripture says in Psalm 90 and verse 10, if reason by strength we have four score years, yet is our strength labor and sorrow, for they're soon cut off and we fly away. In verse 12 he said, teach us, Lord, to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And I'll tell you, it's a wise thing to please God in everything we do. These things that are no-nos. Oh, you hear preachers say, oh, we preach positive. We don't preach negative. I don't either. I'm just as positive about this as I can be. I'm positive about the yeas and I'm positive about the nays. God's got a lot of yeses in here and he's got a lot of no-nos. If you're going to please God and inherit eternal life, You've got to observe the yeas, and you've got to observe the nays. The Bible tells us there's some no-nos that we cannot submit to. In 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, some more of our great teacher, the beloved apostle. Turn to 1 Corinthians 10, if your Bibles, please. <coughs> Verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. Isn't that a classic statement? Moreover, brethren, I would not, you should be ignorant. God don't want Christians ignorant. How are you going to be unignorant or <laughs> lacking in ignorance and be informed? You're going to have to listen to a teacher that teaches you the Bible and not just philo philosophical persuasions. I want to teach you now not to be ignorant, he says. How our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. They were all baptized under Moses in the cloud in the sea. They did all eat the same spiritual meat. That was the manna God gave them. They did all drink the same spiritual drink. Now listen to this. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. There was a flint rock about that big around, 42 stops in that church of Moses out of Egypt to Canaan's land had stops for 40 years, 42 stopovers, rest areas. They stopped there. They didn't take that big old flint rock. I don't think they had anybody could have it. I don't believe Samson could have picked it up unless the Spirit of God didn't come on him mighty. That old big flint rock. In every stop they made, that flint rock was already there. They didn't take that flint rock with them. There's an angel or somebody who took that flint rock and put it where the cloud was going to stop the next time. Moses didn't tell them where to stop. There was a pillar of cloud that went before them. And when it stopped, they stopped. It was the Holy Ghost leaving. And there was a big old flint rock there. And Moses, all he had to do was get up there and speak to that rock. And the water just gush out that old hard flint rock. They watched that miracle for 40 years. Them hard-headed rascals, they were filled with such unbelief and limited God until he had to destroy it. Every one of them from 20 years old upward, except Caleb and Joshua and their families. Because of their unbelief and limiting God after they'd seen his great miracles. What a hard-headed bunch. That was the first church God ever had. You don't believe the church? Read Acts 7, 38. The Bible calls it the church in the wilderness. All right, here's a record of that church in the wilderness. They drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. God's still not well pleased with many today in the church of Jesus Christ. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now listen to this, folks. Now these things were our examples in that church of Moses. These things were our examples. To the intent we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink like the church does today and rose up to pray. Uh-oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. To play. The church ought to eat and drink, rise up to pray, but they don't. They rise up to pray. Play. Moses had the same trouble a real man of God has today. You know, the Lord said in Matthew 23, 1 and 2 that a Pharisee sat in Moses' seat. Who do you think sitting in Moses' seat today? Where a prophet of God ought to be? We still got a Pharisee. He says in verse 8, Don't you commit fornication as some of them church members committed. And they fell in one day 23,000 God killed them young people that committed fornication with the young people of Midian. God slew them. 23,000. 
6,000 young folks went away and committed immorality. Read it. Numbers, the 24th chapter. What a tragedy. Holocaust. Verse 9. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them tempted and were destroyed as serpents. Numbers 21. God sent poisonous, fiery serpents into the camp and they bit many people in that church and they died because of their tempting the Lord. All right, verse 10. Don't murmur as some of them in Moses' church murmured. These are our examples, God says. And they were destroyed by the destroyer. Numbers 11. The people murmured against God and against Moses, saying, Would to God we died in Egypt. Wish we'd stayed in Egypt where there's plenty of fish and garlic and cantaloupes, <laughs> cucumbers, and all kind of stuff. Fishes. But why don't you bring us out here in this wilderness? Nothing here to eat but that old man of God gave us an hour. So loathe that old man. Loathe. People still loathe. You know what the man it was? The Word of God. It's still the Word of God, the man of the bread of heaven. People still loathe. <clears throat> Listen to verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they're written for our admonition. What happened in the church of Moses? The rebellion, the lust, the immorality, the murmuring, the seditions, that's that uprising against the authority of the servant of God. God judged it. And he says, I'll judge the church of the end time like I judged the church of Moses. Oh, these boneheaded preachers, they don't believe that today. Well, so what? That don't change God, it don't change His Word, and it's not going to change the destiny of them people that blindly follow Him like the Pied Piper of Hamlin who led the rats to destruction in the sea because of their stupidity. Right. Lord, you don't have to be a rat. You don't have to follow a Pied Piper. Well, that's what most Christians are doing today, pathetically. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand to take heed lest he fall. Folks, there's some arrogance there that's manifest from that scripture. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Have you seen any arrogant Christians around? Oh, I couldn't backslide if I had to. He's already backslid. The only reason you can't backslide is because you've done that way or you didn't ever have nothing to start with. Arrogance! That's what destroys Christians. And these preachers today mostly mistake their arrogance for inspiration. Yeah. Just like an old vacuum cleaner salesman come around to your house. Got one of them kind he thinks is the best. And, yeah. I got a Hoover! Oh, I want one of them filter queens. Ah, Lord. Here comes the Ford salesman. Y'all not to drive a Chevy. The Chevy comes. Y'all not to fool with them old Fords. You can get a lemon in all of them. I've had lemons. Them Chevrolet's like to run me crazy. I wouldn't have one for nothing, but that don't mean that I'm good cars. I just got two or three lemons and threw me on the side of the road. My family and I had created more. Woo! Desperation you ever seen. I wouldn't have a Chevrolet. But you might be the old, like the old lady in Alabama preaching. Maybe she's a prophetess. I go, you go, we go in Chevrolet. <laughs> so the Lord's telling us to leave. I don't want to go into a Chevrolet. I don't even want to ride with you in one. But I ain't going around. This, this is not a commercial now. I'm just using that as an example of how people are about things that has spoiled them, has hurt them. It's almost destroyed them. You ought to be wary of it, hadn't you? Yes. Why are you fooling around with a preacher about ruins? Your church is about ruins. Your philosophy, like people are getting out of Mormonism, getting out of Catholicism, getting out of the Muslims and all. They're about to destroy them and take them to hell. You ought to be wary if you can escape out of it. Most people's not going to escape. Just one every now and then. But I tell you, this arrogance won't get you anywhere. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand and take heed lest he fall, backslide, go back home, God, and be lost, and go to hell. That ain't no laughing matter. You ain't going to die laughing if you die and go into hell. No fellow named Ingersoll, I remember him. I was a kid. I remember him back in the 20s. He died about 1929, about the year of the stock market collapse. He spread infidelity and atheism, preached it all over America. 
He had a great debate, I believe it was him with old William Jennings Bryan, the silver tongue orator, politician, ran for president, had the monkey trial up in Tennessee, won the debate, and kept evolution out of the schools of Tennessee for a long time. Old Linger saw. He died in Cleveland, Ohio in the late 20s. He taught infidelity all over this nation. You believe what you want to in this crazy country of ours. Democracy, believe what you want to. Go to hell if you want to. Die like a fool or a hog on Sunday if you want to. Yeah, you can, but you're going to not go get no bliss out of it when you reach, when you reach the pits of the lost and hear the screams and cries in the, the regions of the tormented. He's still on the street in Cleveland, Ohio. Five years before he died, he was out there preaching his stinking atheism with them college students and everybody else he could get out there around him, shook his fist at God. He said, if there's a God up there, I defy him to strike me dead. I'm going to wait five minutes, and if he hasn't struck me dead, you folks know there ain't no God up there. Well, he was standing there waiting. A little old woman over there as a Christian happened to come by and heard this rant and a rave of this fool. From, uh, Psalm 14 and 1 says, The fool saith in his heart there is no God. I didn't call him a fool. God called him a fool. She went up to him and said, Sir, may I speak to you? He said, Yes. He said, Do you have children? Yes, I have two. He said, Would you load two guns, play Russian roulette with them, put a bullet in each one and tell your kids to pull that trigger beside the temple there for it. He said, no. He said, I love them too much. He said, she said, sir, that's the reason you're not dead right now. Because God loves you enough, he don't want you to go to hell or you will be dead. Five years later, he was dying in a Cleveland hospital with a dread disease that didn't even diagnose him. And there in his last few moments, with a nurse, a two or three nurses and some relatives in that room, he began to scream. And he said, my God, if there is a God, let him have mercy on me. I feel the flames of hell enveloping me. Late date, my, bud, my boy, my girl. Late date. Too late. One old boy in college, or his daddy wrote him back when he wrote for money. It said, too bad, too sad, you're dead. That's what God writes you back. God says in Proverbs 1, let me see, it's a good place to start in that book there somewhere. Proverbs 1, verse 24, it's a great book, a great chapter. Because I called you refused. I stretched out my hand. God said, and no man regarded. Ye sought it not. All my counsel. You would none of my reproof. Here it is, right in this black bound book. It stands between you and hell. And it stands as a bridge over the chasm that you can walk over to heaven. Because you called and I refused. You, I stretched out my hand and no man regarded. You said it not all my counsel. You were none of my reproof. He said, therefore, I'll laugh at your calamity. I'll mock you when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation. And your anguish cometh as a whirlwind. When it, fear and anguish seize upon you, you'll call on me just like Ingersoll did. And I won't answer you. You'll seek me. But you won't find me. Listen to verse 30. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Therefore they shall eat the ways of their own destruction. The prosperity of fools shall slay them. They'll die in their own folly and go astray in their own foolishness. God says because you call in the day when you rejected me and walked arrogantly and said nothing could happen to me, I couldn't fall. Oh, something good will come after a while. Let me tell you, there's a day, there's a time of salvation when God will listen to you and there's a day God will not hear you when you call 
when you're sinking like Ingersoll, going down into the pits of the bluff. And you cry out and God says, sorry, bud. I stretched my hand out to you and you slapped it away. I stretched out both hands to you certain times and you slapped them away. Now God says, ha, ha, ha. I'll laugh at your calamities because when I called, you wouldn't answer. When I stretched out my hand to save you, you wouldn't regard it. I'm like old Joshua said at the end of his lifetime in Joshua, in the 24th chapter, verse 12. He called all the people of Israel out there in his presence, in his presence as he was getting ready to have to drop the mantles of leadership because of his old age. He said, I don't know what, what, what you folks, you parents and children are going to do with your lives, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Praise God. Do you think he had problems? Yes, he had problems. Everything don't go easy when you make a resolution and a vow to Almighty God, I'm going to serve him. When you tell Jesus Christ the day or the night, when you commit your life to him, I give you myself to serve you. You don't know what all that means. You're going to have a time resisting the devil fighting the flesh. You're going to do it? What about if you don't do it? What kind of time are you going to have? You're going to have a worse time. And your end is going to be a tragedy and not something that you can rejoice into. You begin to think of the future. Lord, have mercy sakes. I think of what the Bible tells us to do about all these problems in life that arises and creates us great troubles. As old Malachi warns us over in the third chapter of Malachi, in verse 8 or verse 7, he says, From the days of your fathers, you've gone away from my ordinance and you haven't kept them. If you'll return to me, I will return to you. Isn't that a deal? God said, you just come on back to me and I'll return to you. But they said, wherein shall we return? Then God says, will a man rob God? You've robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? God says, in tithes and in offerings, and you're cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. And that nation was the church of the living God. When you rob God, you're inviting a curse because sin always invites. problems, 
I'll begin to resolve them. If you got family troubles, I'll be with you in the middle of all of it. If you got spiritual problems, this is the answer. This is the underlying cause of your spiritual deficiency. James says about money, the love of money, where's this James 5 and 10, the 6 and 10, the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money, which while some have coveted after, they have heard from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. When you hang on to the money that's God's that ties an offering, you are opening the windows of heaven for a curse and not a blessing. Physical affliction, heartache, sorrow, trouble. God have mercy. Finally, healed into God's judgments as a fool. You can't afford to have this. I can't help but don't please you. Galatians 1 and 10, this great apostle I've been quoting from today said, If I should please men, I should not be the servant of Jesus Christ. He said, I strive not to please men, but I strive to please God. For if I please God, I'm not the servant of Christ. You can't please men. The man of God must stand between you and God, between you and hell, and hold up a barricade and say, turn from that sin that's going to bring a curse and heartache and affliction upon you. And if he wants to get up here and tickle your ears, he's the worst enemy you've got in this world. If that word doesn't censor you and bring conviction and make you feel uncomfortable, that man is not obeying the voice of God and not anointed by the Holy Ghost that was sent to be the mediator between God and man in the name of Jesus Christ in this world. Yeah. Lord, God grant us grace in your sight. God said, if you'll bring your tithes and offerings, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. Malachi 3.11. And he'll not destroy the fruits of your ground. Your vine will not cast your fruit before the time of the field. The nations will call you blessed. You'll be a delightsome land, says the Lord. If you'll obey my voice and trust me, you'll be all pleasing in my sight. And I'll give you the grace and the victory through the blood of the everlasting covenant to make you complete and whole in every good work. In conclusion, let me repeat this, then I'll close. Hebrews 13, 20, 21. Now the God of peace that brought a game from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing. Well-pleasing. In whose sight? In his sight. Through Jesus Christ. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 22, and I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation. You know what Paul said? Hey, I hope you'll accept this. He said, I hope you will allow this to penetrate and be a part of what you've learned of how to please God. For I have written a letter unto you in few words. I've written you this letter, and I beseech you, brethren, that you'll suffer me to give you this word of exhortation. The Apostle Paul, in my opinion, is the greatest preacher in the Word of God. Jesus could have been the greatest. He didn't choose to be. He said, I'll send you the Holy Ghost and He'll teach you things that I can't even tell you about now. And this great Paul came along with mysteries unveiled through the Spirit and written by the Spirit to you and I that we can have the unveiling of the mysteries of God's will that we don't have to stumble through life. We don't have to blunder around because we've got the perfected Word of God that tells us how to please God and then to abound more and more as we endeavor to serve Him with our whole heart. Shall we pray? Our Father, I thank You, Father, for the Word of God. It's a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto to, according to the Word? Oh, Lord, as old Jeremiah said, is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh a rock in pieces? Yes, it is. And we thank you for the incorruptible, uncompromising word of God. It has no favorites. And what you expect of me, you expect of everybody else. What you expect of the Apostle Paul, you expect of us and me and all the saints of this end time generation. And let us take heed 
that we think we stand lest we fall. Keep us from that old spirit of arrogance, Lord, that we'll strive to be humble and walk humbly with our God in Jesus' name and in the fear of God. We pray that you'll grant us that great grace. Amen.